and the kingdom of darkness with light, and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ, to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. As Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper with His disciples at the Passover, Jesus took that fruit of the vine and He said these words in Matthew 26, 28. This is my blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. We welcome you today to our final lesson in the life and teaching of Jesus from the Gospel of Matthew. Today we're going to be studying that powerful section of Christ going up to the cross and dying for us in Matthew 26 through 28. We hope that if you haven't got your Bible handy, that you'll go ahead and do that right now so that we can search the Scriptures together and be impacted by what Jesus did for each one of us. As we open to Matthew 26, we see the plot begin to unfold, to sell out the Lord and ultimately point Him toward and push Him toward the cross. Matthew 26, about verses 1 through 14, we have several events that are going to happen. The Jewish leaders are now going to come to Judas and they're going to offer him a certain amount of money, 30 pieces of silver, set up a plot to tempt Jesus. Judas is going to agree to that and he eventually is going to sell out the Lord for that little amount of money, which he is eventually going to greatly regret. And so one of the first lessons we see in the opening pages of Matthew 26 is this. Don't be like Judas and sell out the Lord. They say, well, what do you mean? I don't have the opportunity to sell out the Lord. He's already been sold out and he died and he's gone back to heaven. In a figurative sense, can't each one of us, if we're not careful, sell out the Lord today? They say, well, what do you mean by that? If we put things before God, greed, worldliness, sin, pleasure, false religion and false ideas, family, friends, have we not in essence sold out the Lord for something else? We need to make sure that in this life we don't commit the sin that Judas committed. That is, he was willing to put money and greed in the place of the Savior and Jesus took a back seat to his own personal interest and ideas at that time. Now, another lesson that we're going to learn in Matthew 26 is as Jesus knows the things that are about to happen and He realizes that His hour has actually come, in preparation for that, Jesus is going to spend time in prayer with the Father. He's going to take His disciples into the Garden of Gethsemane. They're going to stay and wait. Jesus says, watch and pray lest you fall in temptation. He's going to go away and pray. The Bible will teach us that it's in great agony. But one of the things that we really learn from this, really two lessons, we learn about the power of prayer. You know, Jesus was the Son of God. He was God in the flesh. But He knew how important it was to communicate with the Father, especially in these times of great anguish. Friend, from the life of Jesus here in His teaching, we learn also about the power of prayer. Luke 18, 1, Jesus said, Men ought always to pray and never lose heart. Don't get discouraged. Don't give up. Do like Jesus and turn to God in prayer. Do you remember the words of Hebrews 4, verse 16? Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find grace and mercy to help in time of need. And it was Peter who said in 1 Peter 5, 7, Cast all your cares upon Him. Why? He cares for you. But then there's a second, and it's a very powerful lesson that we learn from the life of Jesus about submission to God's will. Notice the words of Matthew chapter 26, and I want you to look with me in verse number 39. He went a little further, that is Jesus, and fell on His face and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Friend, Jesus no doubt knew and He saw, and He was aware of the agony that was about to happen. 
he realized that his human life was going to be snuffed out. In the human side, if there were any other way, let this cup pass from me. It was his anguish and his desire, no doubt, and the impending uh, agony that he would face. But then you hear these words, Not my will, but thine be done. Friend, as we think about the things that often face us in this life, as I think about the struggles I have, as I think about the decisions I've got to make, as we think about the constant fight with sin and, and sometimes the things that occur in this life, what needs to kind of override everything we do? Well, let me illustrate it from another passage. James 4, verses 13 through 17 is a context that is directly relative to what we're thinking about today. A certain man or certain people are going to take part in a business venture. They say to themselves, uh, we'll go to this place for a year, we'll buy, we'll sell, we'll make much gain. And there wasn't a problem with any of that necessarily, but there was a problem. James says, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills. We'll do this or we'll do that. We'll buy and sell and make much gain. And thus James will say in James 4, 17, For him that knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is a sin. Putting God's will above every action and above every decision has to be the overriding banner of my life. That statement, not my will, but thine be done, has to encompass and control everything that I do in this life. And so we want to make sure that in being submissive to God that we're submitting to the teaching of Christ as it relates to letting God control and govern our life. Now as we think about Matthew chapter 26, there's another very powerful and practical lesson that we learn in this text and it's about the Apostle Peter. I want you to look in Matthew 26 verses 69 through 75. Notice what the text teaches us here. The Bible says, now this is after Jesus has been taken, he's being questioned. Now Peter sat outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him saying, you also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all saying, I do not know what you're saying. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. Now watch this. Then Peter began to curse and to swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the words of Jesus who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. You know, as we think about what happened to Peter here, the relationship between Peter and Jesus, and as Peter is, you know, sometimes striving to step up and take a leadership position, Peter here is challenged with his commitment to Christ. How strong was Peter's commitment to Jesus at this point? Not as strong as it needed to be. How do we know that? Peter had already said, Lord, if I have to die for your name, I'll go with you. No, Peter, you're not ready yet. You were with him, weren't you? Oh, no, not me. Uh, you sound like him, surely. Oh, no, no, I don't even know the man. And then you imagine this in your own mind. Peter begins to curse and swear. Can you imagine the Apostle Peter cursing? Curse and swear. I don't even know. Who are you talking about? I don't even know the man. And then the echo of that rooster crowing in Peter's ear. And he went out and wept bitterly. What did Peter have to learn? His commitment wasn't quite what he thought it was. There were areas he needed to develop and grow in to really make the commitment to Christ that he should have. I believe this is a big part of why Peter will say in 1 Peter 2 verse 2, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And in 2 Peter 3 verse 18, Grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so, you know, when everything's going good, when life is going so smooth, it's easy to commit to Christ. It's when the difficulties come. 
It's when confrontation arises. It's when our life might be on the line that we really have to ask ourselves, how committed am I really to following Jesus? Or like Peter, are there some areas that I definitely need to grow in to make my commitment stronger? We then turn our attention to a statement in Matthew chapter 27, verse number 2. I want you to notice this statement. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate the governor. Mark 15 tells us they bound the hands of Jesus. Uh, here we've got people promoted by Judas and is kissing Jesus and denying the Lord as well, uh, who are willing to take Jesus and bind him. They bound the hands of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Could He have broken those bonds? Absolutely. Could He have called down a legion? Absolutely. But Jesus willingly allowed Himself to be bound by evil men. Now friend, I want to make a practical application to this. They bound the hands of Jesus physically there uh, to take Him, ultimately to try Him, and to crucify Him. But figuratively, do we not sometimes bind the hands of Jesus today? Do we not limit what Jesus can do by binding His ability? Friend, when we're not as evangelistic as we ought to be, we're not binding the hands of Jesus. When, when we don't give to the local congregation like the Bible teaches we ought to give on the first day of the week, aren't we binding the hands of Jesus? When we don't study, when we don't pray, when we're not as benevolent and as helpful and we don't love God like we ought to? Aren't we binding the hands of Jesus figuratively today and not letting His full power and His will take place in our life? Now, as we think through the rest of today's lesson, we just simply want to focus on what the Lord and Savior did for me and what He did for you in going to the cross and dying. And while we think about these passages, I want you to keep this in mind. The Bible says Jesus tasted death for every man, Hebrews 2 verse 9, if for every man, for this man, and for you as well. Jesus did the things we're about to notice so that I could have the hope of eternal life and so that you could have the hope of eternal life. Listen to the, listen to the personal nature of 1 Peter 2 24. He himself bore our sins in his own body upon the tree that we having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we were healed. Well, what exactly did Jesus do? Let's turn our attention to Matthew 27, verses 15 through 21. Jesus, so that I could have the hope of eternal life, He took the place of a common criminal. Matthew 27, look at verse 15. At the feast of a governor was accustomed to release, releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Who do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? For he knew they had handed Jesus over because of envy. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him, saying, Have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? And they all said to him, Let him be crucified. A notorious criminal. We don't know exactly all the details, but when you think of notorious, you can imagine in your own mind a thief, a murderer, a rapist, a killer, uh, an extortioner. Jesus took the place of this common criminal and that man was let free, able to live his life again in freedom. Why did he do that? He committed no crimes of his own. 1 Peter 2.21 He committed no sin. Hebrews 4.15 He took the place of that common criminal for me and for you. What else happened to Jesus? Our Lord and Savior is now going to be scourged. And the Bible doesn't say a whole lot about it. But listen to the words of Matthew 27, verse number 26. The Scripture says, 
Then Pilate released Barabbas to them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. What exactly is a scourging? A scourge is basically a, a, a whipping, a very abusive and tormenting whipping, uh, something like a bullwhip, except it's got more tails on it. Uh, is used. It's usually held in the hand, not on a long whip, but held in the hand. It contains leather strips, multiple leather strips coming down it. History reveals from evidence they found in archaeology that many of these whips had sharp pieces of bone or glass or metal embedded into the end of that whip. And then that, that person's back would be made very tight Maybe sometimes they would hang them and tighten their back from a ceiling. Other times they would take them and wrap them around a pole where the muscles and the skin of their back are as tight as you can make it. And then they would bring that whip over and over again across the back of that common criminal. Jesus was beaten with that scourging whip, with the metal, with the bone, with the glass embedded in it, over and over again. They raked it across the back of Jesus. Why? He was beaten for our transgression. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. Isaiah chapter 53, verse number 4. Every stripe that was laid on the back of Jesus, I deserved and you deserved because of our sin. And yet Jesus lovingly did that for me and you. Friend, I'll promise you, nobody's ever loved you like Jesus loved you. Watch what happens next. Matthew 27, verse number 29. The scripture then says, When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. You know, when we talk about this crown of thorns, maybe you've seen vines or branches like this in your area. Maybe like a honey locust tree, you've got these really long thorns on vines. That's what we're not talking about just a, a little thorn. We're talking about these long thorns. They made a, a crown out of that. They twisted all that together, put a crown with those long thorns on Jesus' head. Now, how gently do you think they placed that on the Lord's head? Well, they're already mocking Him. They're going to spit on Him. They're going to make fun of Him. They're trying to inflict the maximum amount of pain they can on Jesus. As they take that crown of thorns, imagine as the thorns press in to the head of Jesus. They then, they then according to Matthew 27, verse 30, they will bow the knee, they will mock Jesus, hail King of the Jews, and then the Bible says they spit on the Lord and Savior. Now friend, not only is Jesus already in humongous, a major amount of agony and pain because of the a scourging, not only are the thorns piercing into His brow, but now His own creation, who He came to save, spits in His face. Can you imagine how degrading and humiliating? You ever had anybody spit on you? Can you imagine how horrible of a feeling that... And not only, you know, somebody might spit on you and you might deserve it. I don't know for sure, but maybe. Not Jesus. The very people He came to save from the worst problem ever, their sin and eternal torment, spit in the face of Jesus. Then they take that reed that they're going to give Jesus as a kingly staff to mock Him. They take that reed and they beat Him on the head with it. Now imagine already, Jesus has this crown of thorns on His head. They take that reed, and when they hit Jesus on the head with it, what happens to all those thorns? They press further into the skull and the scalp of Jesus. Imagine the pain and the agony that must have been for the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, as you follow the events that occur in Matthew 27, verse 31, they then, they then the Bible tells us, they put a purple robe on Jesus, then they take that robe off. Now, I want you to stop right here and think about this. If you've ever had a bad cut on yourself, and you take and put a Band-Aid on it, that Band-Aid will stop that bleeding and it will adhere to it. But how much fun is it to take that Band-Aid off after, after everything's dried and stuck to it? You take that Band-Aid off, it's like starting all over again. 
the bloody back of Jesus. That, that robe adheres to the blood in the back and it begins to dry, it sticks to the skin. And then imagine as they rip that robe off again, all the blood, all the pain, and all the flesh is torn all over again. Why did he do that for me and you? He tasted death for every man. And then listen to the words of Matthew 27, verse number 35. The Bible then records this. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Now friend, the, this is one of the great things about the inspiration of the Bible. Men would like to write volumes about the crucifixion. How long does it take the Bible to tell us about that event? One sentence. Then they crucified him. Just four or five words. What happened at a crucifixion? Men's, the Bible tells us, Psalm 22 and John, the last chapter in John will tell us, Jesus had you know, nail prints in his hands. Psalm 22 prophesied that. Jesus' hands through the wrist bones that are very strong would have been nailed to a cross. His feet then were also nailed to a cross through his ankle bones, which are very strong. Then that cross is raised up with Jesus hanging on it. And you can imagine in your own mind, for every breath that you take in, you push against the nails in the ankle. For every breath that you let out, you pull against the nails in your, in your wrist. For every breath, Jesus had to push on the nails in his ankles and the nails in his wrist and it was torment and agony just to breathe. And friend, Jesus took the curse of the cross, Galatians 3 verses 15 through 20, upon himself so that I wouldn't have to bear that cross. He was beaten, he was mocked, he was spit upon, he was crucified. According to Matthew 27 verse 50, Jesus shouted out with a loud voice, It is finished. And he gave up his spirit, returned it to the Father eventually. Why did he do that? Why did Jesus endure such torment and agony and pain? For me and for you. Listen again to 1 Peter 2.24. He himself bore our sins in his own body upon the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live, by right might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Friend, didn't, Jesus didn't do that because he had sin. He did that so that I don't have to go to hell and suffer the eternal condemnation and the judgment of my sins. That's how much God and how much Christ loves you. Now, think about this. You hear the words of John 3, 16, and it's a lovely verse. But think about it in view of Matthew 27. God so loved the world he gave. What do you mean he gave? He gave Jesus to suffer everything we just heard about. He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes on Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But now, friend, aren't you glad the story doesn't end with Jesus dying on the cross? According to the Bible, Jesus would stay in the cross or stay in the grave for a period of about three days, and then He would rise out of the grave. And we open our Bible to Matthew 28, verse 1, and notice what the Scripture says. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, his clothing as white as snow, and the guard shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know you seek Jesus who was crucified. Listen to these words. He is not here. He is risen. Death didn't break Him down and end Him. The grave did not contain Him. Jesus conquered death. He conquered the grave. And He is right now living at the right hand of God. Proof positive again. Jesus is the Son of God. Now the soldiers are bribed according to verses 11 through 15, to tell a story, but even their stories didn't mesh. And the risen Savior, He comes back to His disciples and He gives them this charge. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel of every creature. Go into all, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now friend, here's the application in the few moments we've got remaining. 
I want you to realize today, God wants us to realize today, just how much He loved us. He sent His Son to die a horrible death of torment and agony so that I could have the hope of heaven. And what He asks of us is to obey Him and to live for Him. Have you done that? Have you obeyed the gospel of Christ? Here's what Jesus said. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, 16. Are you living for Him? And friend, imagine what God wants of us. If He would do that for His Son, imagine how wonderful heaven's going to be for each one of us. If you've never obeyed the gospel, in view of the great sacrifice of Christ, we beg you, obey the gospel of Christ before it's too late. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.